Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman. And Daniela Velasquez. And John Quasarano. Today we'll be exploring Winnicott's seminal paper, Transitional Objects and Transitional Phenomena, that you can find in his book, Playing and Reality. This is our continued exploration of the early developmental theory of D.W. Winnicott. And we move into the paper, Transitional Objects, and he introduces this idea of the intermediate area of experience. I have introduced the terms transitional objects and transitional phenomena for designation of the intermediate area of experience between the thumb and the teddy bear, between oral eroticism and true object relationship, between primary creative activity and projection of what has already been interjected, between primary unawareness of indebtedness and the acknowledgement of indebtedness. And I continue an intermediate area of experiencing to which both internal and external reality both contribute. It shall exist as a resting place for the individual engaged in per the perpetual human task of keeping inner and outer reality separate yet interrelated. He brings up this notion of a resting place. And we're gonna talk about how the transitional object and ways of interacting through transitional phenomena that provide a resting place for the psyche. And there are those who never get to rest. They never reach that place where they can be calm and at ease. So the perpetual human task of keeping things separate and interrelated is what we'll be exploring today. So these blankies, teddy bears, soft objects, the mother lets it get dirty and even smelly, knowing that by washing it, she introduces a break in continuity in the infant's experience and break that may destroy the meaning and the value for the infant. Here we're exploring one of these key themes in Winnicott between continuity and discontinuity of experience. I suggest that the pattern of transitional phenomena begins to show at about the four to six to eight to 12 months. Purposely, I leave room for wide variation. The child refers to this as their first possession where they start to use the word my with this object, my blankie, my teddy. And the object must survive rough loving and will not accept much change in smell or appearance easily. Sometimes not at all. The object will just be rejected if it's changed. So the summary of the special quality in the relationship that the child has with the object the infant assumes rights over the object and omnipotence is operative from the start. The object is affectionately cuddled, excitedly loved and mutilated, chewed upon with just glee. It must never change except changed by the infant and must survive instinctual loving and hating. So there must be a certain amount of sturdiness to the, to the object for it to function in this way. 
warmth and texture give the object vitality or reality on its own. And the fate of the transi transitional object is gradually decathected. It loses meaning and becomes diffused. And the symbol is shaped much more broadly through creative and cultural expressions and appreciations. So this move from starting with this very first symbol to broadening out, to be able to make use of all different types of symbols as one develops. Illusion and adaptation are both operative. The good enough mother starts off with an almost complete adaptation to her infant's needs. And as time proceeds, she adapts less and less completely, gradually according to the infant's growing ability to deal with her failure. The mother at the beginning by almost 100% adaptation affords the infant the opportunity for the illusion. Her breast is part of the infant. It is as if it were under the infant's magical control. Omnipotence is nearly a fact of experience. The mother's eventual task is gradually to disillusion the infant, but she has no hope of success unless at first she's been able to give sufficient opportunity for illusion. The mother places the actual breast just there where the infant is ready to create and at the right moment. We can imagine the infant's mouth just opening up just at the time they're ready for the feed and then the breast arrives just as they're closing their mouth in perfect synchrony. So at this time, the unit status is the mother and the child are one. There's no distinction between me and not me at this time. And then there's this budding recognition of the mother as separate and external. We can imagine the child at the breast who clamps down with their jaw on the breast and the mother has a response and moves the breast away. There becomes this clarification for the infant of like me and not me by doing that. We imagine their hand floating up when they're young and seeing the hand and not really sure if the hand that's floating in their vision is me or not me. And the hand has to become brought into that understanding of the body as a part of the body under their control. The object represents the infant's transition from a state of being merged with the mother to a state of being in relation to the mother as something outside and separate. Child transitions from a unity with mother where the child makes no distinction here between me and not me to this fundamental distinction as the mother as separate, okay? So with this acknowledgement of separateness also comes this understanding of being connected in a new way, a new way of understanding that connectedness. The transitional object is the first symbol that the child utilizes. So we're talking about utilizing symbolic representations in the service of development. The child is in a separate room from the parent. And what we find is that the transitional object only shows up in situations where the child is sleeping independently, 
co-sleeping arrangements, you will not see the child develop a transitional object because they don't need to manage this psychic state of separation from the mother. So the infant's capacity to recognize the object is not me. The infant's capacity to create, think up, devise, originate, and produce, right? This idea of a symbol. And here we're moving into abstraction, where the child can have a symbol that represents the mother. And by holding the symbol, thinking of the mother, learn to regulate internally. The object is objective and subjective. It's just a piece of textile. It's a woven piece of cloth and it's my blankie, right? It's both of these things, the objective and the subjective. We see the initiation of an affectionate type of object relationship. And this constitutes the first use of a symbol. The infant finds and creates transitional object and utilizes this object for emotional regulation. We can hear that child <laughs> and they hold the blankie <sighs> and they get into a new place just by holding the symbol, thinking of the primary caretaker that's been interjected. Winnicott talks about this wonderful case that's um, illustrative in so many different ways of a seven-year-old boy, you know, growing up in a home with, you know, kind of struggling parents, but just, just getting by, mother with uh, serious depressive symptoms, drug use in the home. And Winnicott takes a very very detailed developmental history. And one of the wonderful things you can learn from Winnicott is how to take a, a really good developmental history. And he identifies these little traumas, traumatas. Some of them are very significant. Some of them are a little bit more minor that the child had to deal with in the toddler stage of development. And the birth of a sister who had mental challenges that were pretty significant when he was three years, three months. And mother went to the hospital for an operation at three years, seven months. And then her depression got so severe, she was in the hospital when he was four years and nine months. And this boy presents with symptoms of startling easily and making threats to cut mother's sister, who's the aunt who watched him when mother was away in the hospital, into little pieces, a compulsion to lick things. He had a vocal tick, tendency to retain feces and then make a mess. And this whole behavior around tying strings to connect and uh, also taking this string and tying it around his sister's neck. Lots of play in the house uh, related to the string. And Winnicott's interpretation most broadly was that the child's dealing with a fear of separation and utilizing the string symbolically as a way to connect. Winnicott introduces this new form of therapy that he begins to practice with parents. And um, this was a family that lived far away on the countryside and he knew he wasn't gonna be able to see the child weekly. So after some discussion with the parents, he, he brings them in as parent therapists and encouraging the mother to have a therapeutic conversation with the child 
with respect to these events that he went through at toddlerhood, now that he's seven, in a way that he could perhaps understand. After the mother-child conversation, and she made the very significant comment that she felt the most important separation to have been his loss of her when she was seriously depressed. It was not just her going away, she said, but her lack of contact with him because of her complete preoccupation with other matters. So that was at the four-year-old time when mother went severely depressed and then was hospitalized for several months. And she identified that as, as the worst of all of the separations after having this therapeutic conversation with her son. In that conversation, she was really able to communicate her understanding of how hard those separations were for the child. Winnicott continues and he reports that over time, the adolescent, um, though the child showed some improvement for years, the next separation where the adolescent is gonna separate away from the home, the child is severely crippled and um, the function of the string starts to change meaning at this time to a denial of the separation, where at first the string was in the service of joining and wrapping up and trying to contain a lot of unintegrated material from the toddler phase. Unsatisfactory adolescent running away back to home. And it's so interesting to find adolescents who are, are, are they running away from home or are they running to home? Um, it's very important to clarify that. The failed separation, unresolved dependency leading to drug addiction, lazy with no motivation to individuate and separate. So what are the general implications that we can draw from this paper? How to facilitate transitions more generally? So here we have a child moving from unit status to hatching and going through this big psychological transition in the first individuation. And they develop a way creatively to manage that tension state through the use of this symbol. More generally, how, how can parents, educators, facilitate transitions? All the transit, transition to kindergarten, transition to high school, transition out of the home, We begin with containing the child's experience and presenting the world in small doses. And that's a, that's a phrase from the title of a wonderful piece that Winnicott wrote in the, the book that you see here, where we don't overwhelm the child early with too much sensory information. And that gets managed and regulated by the caretaker to allow the child to digest the world in small doses and not be, be overwhelmed and forced to uh, dissociate. Empathy for the child's developmental challenge in the moment, and this includes patience and tolerance of the negative emotions that are expressed. Use words to help the child better understand their challenges and use words to help the child understand and become emotionally prepared for changes in routine and caretaker. So they're given warning that they're gonna spend tomorrow at grandma's house or grandpa is gonna pick them up from daycare. And there's these preparations beforehand 
And more generally, the routine is used as a way to hold and contain and manage the child through that regularity. So the breaks in the routine are noted and efforts to help the child facilitate those discontinuities um, is a really important part of parent therapy. So creating routines, routines of care help to support the child going through these transitional challenges. Having a sleep time, a meal time, a book time, a bath time, and that these happen with regularity through a sequence and the child comes to be held through them. We spoke about taking a developmental history, utilizing information about transitional object use to inform case conceptualization and treatment planning. So if the child can hold a teddy bear, think of the mother and change their consciousness, phase change to a calmer place, we can gather from that that there was good enough care. Did the child make use of a transitional object and what was its importance? Did the child develop the capacity to regulate somewhat of their experience that can be reported from the parent through the transitional object? How did, did the infant or does the child handle transitions more generally and exploring those challenges? Typically challenges about dependency. So what examples did the parents share about these? How well does the parent facilitate transitions for the child? And how can they find better strategies for doing that? Um, so we're asking the parents about, hey, did, did the child have a special object growing up that was really important to them, teddy bear or a blankie? And just allowing the parents to reflect on that. Or did say no, no, he sucked his thumb or had a pacifier which are very different when you're having a pacifier or sucking your thumb, you're soothing orally as Winnicott reported earlier. And the oral soothing is different than the symbolic function of thinking of the mother and utilizing that symbol for regulation. So we're talking about a different process of soothing. It's more primitive and less developed than the use of the object, which opens up creative pathways. So the presence of a transitional object suggests adequate, good enough attachment. The presence of a transitional object strongly suggests the presence of good enough parenting. The child is able to self-regulate by holding the blanket and thinking of the mother or the primary caretaker, using the symbol in the service of self-regulation. And this is this move into abstraction. It's through the attachment that the child can move into abstract thinking using symbols. You'll find children with poor attachments remain concrete on the surface and lack depth. So while the presence of the transitional object suggests attachment, however, it is not to the contrary. The absence of a transitional object does not suggest anything meaningful about attachment. It is, however, an opportunity 
for the evaluating clinician to explore with parents how the child learned to co-regulate with the mother and how did the child learn to self-regulate on their own in toddlerhood and childhood. So most cultures in the world have patterns of co-sleeping where the infant is in the bed with the mother. We in the West have the child in the crib in a separate bedroom. And that co-sleeping arrangement is really what primes the pump for the emergence of the transitional object. It's a creative solution that the child develops to that separation. In closing, I'm going to share with you an adult reflection on his use of a transitional object. Uh, this student of mine from uh, years past was generous enough to uh, allow me to share this with other people. And uh, I think you'll find his story enriching and um, allowing you to see how, how the function of the transitional object developmentally really works um, from one subjective perspective. 11 years ago, my mother died from respiratory failure at the age of 70. I was 36 years old at the time, living in another state. My father had died many years earlier, and I had only one brother who was disabled. Following her death, I began the task of cleaning out the house, my childhood home since I was born, preparing it for sale. I started therapy because of complex emotions I was feeling over my mother's death and feelings brought upon, brought up returning to my boyhood home. During this course of therapy, I recalled many repressed memories from my childhood. I had a reoccurring dream during this time that involved dead rodent-like animals. Sometimes these animals were biting me, even though they were dead. Though always quite vivid, these dreams had sad, morbid sense to them. I recall during one session finding my teddy bear when cleaning out the closets at the house. I hadn't played with it for many years. My mother had saved it in the attic. Sometime I glanced at it when I was up there for a visit. However, during the house cleaning, I decided it was time to part with it and I threw it away. I can still remember the moment. When I recalled this moment while in therapy, I immediately connected to the dreams of the animals. It was the teddy bear that I threw away that haunted me. This animal was my transitional object, the only one I remember. I used it to play with it until I started school. I stopped playing with it after a humiliating incident that occurred when I was four years old. When I was a child, I would borrow my neighbor's clothes and play dress up like a girl. I remember my mother subtly encouraged this behavior and my father looked the other way. One day when I was dressed up and holding my teddy bear as my baby in the front yard, some unfamiliar kids walked by and teased me terribly. I was devastated. I can't be sure, but I do not recall ever dressing as a girl again. I don't think I ever played with my teddy either. I have often said that I am the most uncreative person I know. I have always been afraid to make visible what is meaningful to me. I have not been able to create a bridge between my inner reality and my outside world. I believe that this has developed at least in part because of the fact of my transitional object and the transitional phenomena playing dress up as a girl came to represent humiliation, rejection, and pain. This early rejection of this expression of my inner self contributed to lifelong feeling that there's something wrong with my thoughts and my feelings. 
I learned to hold back every thought, feeling, and movement I had to be censored, shame, and doubt. I believe the dreams were a manifestation of the unprocessed feelings associated with this incident. The object was dead in my dreams. However, my unconscious mind kept the transitional object alive, though expressed as dead in dreams. When I was an infant, that teddy bear comforted me, helped me, helped me know the outside, the world outside myself. It was present at my early trauma in life and again at later trauma. Its meaning was repressed for nearly 30 years until it could properly be processed. That facilitated my efforts at processing other emotional issues in my life. Indeed, my transitional object served me well. This is the conclusion of the first part of our discussion of transitional objects, transitional phenomena. Please join us for the second part as we reflect on personal reflections and case examples and explore the theory more generally. Thank you.